Poyakov uh, conducts research on interreligious and intercultural relations, and she is the assistant professor of the Interdisciplinary Study of Religion at Merrimack College. She's the author of three books, The Nun in the Synagogue, Judeo-Centric Catholicism in Israel, which is right here, and I believe uh, one of our assistants will be putting a, a link for purchasing this and other books in the chat. Her other books are Remembering the Future, the Experience of Time in Jewish and Christian Liturgy, and Anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and Interreligious Hermeneutics. And uh, Dr. Emma Polyakov is currently working on two more books exploring religious perspectives on Jerusalem. Dr. Polyakov holds her doctorate from Boston College in Comparative Theology, and like myself, uh, she had the great fortune of having Dr. Ruth Langer of the Center for Christian Jewish Learning as her dissertation director. So we're so happy to warmly welcome Dr. Poyakov back to Boston College, at least virtually. And Emma, I now turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, it is really a great pleasure to, um, to be here today um, and to be back at Boston College. Um, where I did complete my PhD almost uh, 10 years ago now. Um, so it's really a delight to be here. And I'd really like to thank um, everybody at the Center for Christian Jewish Learning for inviting me here and for um, making this possible. Um, so today I am gonna be speaking about my um, latest book. Uh, it came out during, at the height of COVID. Um, and so just now beginning to uh, give presentations on it and so forth. Um, so this book, The Nun in the Synagogue, Judeo-Centric Catholicism in Israel, uh, explores a phenomenon of um, certain Catholics in Israel. And I say certain Catholics because it is certainly not characteristic of most Catholics in Israel. Um, certain Catholics, primarily um, nuns and monks and religious brothers and sisters, primarily of European and North American or origin, who evidence a very surprising and rather extraordinary relationship to Judaism. Um, and so for lack of a better term, I've termed this phenomenon Judeo-centric Catholicism. So just first a little bit about um, how I came into this field of inquiry. Um, and then I'm going to kind of talk about some of the main um, issues and questions that arose in the process of the research. Um, and then of course, at the end, we'll have time for um, questions and conversation. So initially I did not plan to write a book on this phenomenon um, because I didn't know about the phenomenon. This is, it, it, it wasn't really identified as such, certainly not in any literature that I had come across. Uh, I discovered it in the process of conducting a very different research project uh, in 2015. I was working on an ethnographic study interviewing Christians in Israel and the West Bank. Um, and after interviewing about 100 Christians, um, all of them clergy, nuns or monks, or religious brothers or sisters, and most of them Catholic, I began to notice a remarkable phenomenon that was linking the testimonies of many of the people whom I spoke with. Many of them would um, jump to the edge of their seats, get very excited when I started to ask them about their views of Judaism, Jewish teaching, Jewish tradition, the Jewish people. And some of them even had tears in their eyes when they started to speak. So I realized there was something very interesting going on here. Um, a number of the people who had this kind of reaction said that their love for Judaism and their love for the Jewish people was really at the call of their own religious vocation. So they said that they had a quote, a call for the Jewish people. I heard many, many people use this phrase. And for many that was really, um, the, the, main, the main focus of their lives as nuns, or religious sisters and so forth. So I realized that I was really witnessing a very distinct form of post-Holocaust Catholic thought about Judaism that really is, a, is very much a product of its context of um, Israel, um, Israel, but not the West Bank. Um, I did not find these perspectives in the West Bank um, amongst Catholics. And um, 
And so it's very contextual phenomenon. And so I set aside the initial research and began working on this. So this phenomenon in a nutshell, I think should be helpful before we go on. So this Judaic centric uh, Catholicism reflects new patterns in Christian perceptions of Jews and Judaism. These patterns I found have arisen from Christian efforts to comprehend the shock of the Holocaust. And they've taken place within the theological worldview in the past half century of, of Catholic theological reforms, and also within the context of contemporary Israel. So um, the Catholics whose narratives are shared in the book, both those whom I interviewed personally and those who um, lived prior to my time, um, did not self-identify as a group. They don't self-identify as being part of a movement. They share no mutually agreed upon sense of principles or practices other than those of the Catholic tradition. Um, a number of them do belong to a congregation or to a monastery within which the focus on Jewish Christian relations is shared and made explicit. Um, most notably, that would be the Sisters of Sion um, within the congregation of the Notre Dame of Sion, um, who have a remarkable history of uh, completely changing their mission in the mid 20th century um, from an original mission um, based on um, praying for the Jews, partly for the conversion of Jews, to then changing it to having a mission based on um, working towards Jewish Christian reconciliation and working to abolish anti Semitism. So that's the Sisters of Zion, and many of them really are a part of what identifies this phenomenon, uh, many but not all, right? But also there are many others who are not members of that congregation, who also exhibit elements of this phenomenon in their personal spiritual lives. Um, and many of those others are completely alone, sharing this with no other members of their monastery or their congregation. So despite this lack of cohesion, I do see a pattern evident across the various uh, people and situations in which this is evident. Um, these patterns are, they are primarily from North America and Europe, but have made long-term or lifelong commitments <clears throat> to remain living in Israel. So none are um, indigenous Christians, that is Arab Christians or Palestinian Christians. Um, there are certainly many uh, Palestinian Christians who are very interested in promoting uh, positive Jewish Christian relations, absolutely. Um, but in this particular phenomenon of what I'm calling Judeo-centric Catholicism, I have found in um, what we can call Western Christians. So um, some of them lead solitary cloistered lives in monasteries. Others live what's known as active religious vocations, um, working with educational programs outside of the monastery, but all are engaging deeply and very intentionally with Jewish teachings and traditions and practices. So this can take the form of um, studying Judaism intensely and deeply, teaching Judaism, teaching Christians about Judaism, um, participating in Jewish Christian dialogue, or for some also practicing elements of Jewish liturgical tradition and other, and other Jewish traditions, right? Hence the, the sort of playful title, the nun in the synagogue. So for each of them motivated by a post-Holocaust desire for atonement and reconciliation uh, and for greater understanding for Christians and Jews, each have come into this sort of uh, expression of, their, of their, um, their faith. So I just wanted to, another note to contextualize it within the different forms of Christianity um, that can be evident in Israel and different forms of Christian engagement with Judaism and with the state of Israel. Um, so amongst these various different forms, there are a few polarized paradigms that emerge um, on one end of the spectrum would be primarily pro-Palestinian uh, theological movements. Um, and on the other end would be what is sometimes known as Christian Zionism, um, largely evangelical movements, right? Um, the Judeo-centric 
Catholicism that I'm looking at here does not fall onto either of those poles and cannot be identified with either of those. Um, it does not entirely align with either, although it certainly has some more similarities with Christian Zionism, but it's a very distinct phenomenon. So another note about this, and that is um, that this is a very small phenomenon. The sample size is small. It's, um, it's not a, a world shaking phenomenon. I don't pretend that it is. Um, but the purpose of this research is not simply to identify the phenomenon or to analyze it, but it's also um, very much a portrait of individuals and a portrait of individuals' relationships with the religious other, really. Um, so this book is not only an analysis of the phenomenon, but um, a, a sort of meditation on um, people's faiths and their relationship to others um, through the interviews that I conducted. So um, this phenomenon can be observed in, um, I'd say two main forms, right? Um, one would be um, people who were born and raised as Catholics, whose spirituality is very immersed in Jewish life and Jewish thought. The other would be people who were born into Jewish families, many of whom were raised as Jewish. Um, others were raised in a mixed Jewish Catholic family. Um, those who were originally Jewish and then converted to Catholicism. Um, those with mixed parentage may have been baptized as children. It depends on the context. Um, but in the second group, many of these people maintain a very strong sense of Jewish identity, even though they are Catholics by faith and by confession. Um, so if you may forgive a little wordplay here, I would call the first group um, fellow Semites at times, and the second group fellow Semites. So from philo Semites to fellow Semites, if you'll forgive the silly little pun. So um, the group, the, the second group who were born as, uh, born into Jewish families, um, many of those people said, as, as I mentioned, that despite their Catholic faith, they firmly felt that their Jewish identity was an intrinsic part of who they were. And this is of course a very controversial um, expression of faith, particularly from many Jewish perspectives. Right. And uh, if we have time, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit. Um, another thing to note about the conversions involved here is that for many of the converts, this conversion happens, process happened during the Holocaust and during very intense trauma. Um, there are a no number of people who, um, whether in hiding or in the immediate aftermath of, of the Holocaust, or in a move to protect their identities and to survive did convert during the Holocaust. Um, some as children, some as adults, and then later maintained that faith and then went on to become uh, nuns or monks and eventually to move to Israel in what they considered to be making Aliyah, right? They considered their movement to move to Israel to be a Jewish move to Israel although as Catholic nuns and monks. Okay, so um, I'd like to talk now a little bit about the really contributing factors. What, what has caused this? What led to this? So I find that there are really three main contributing factors. The first would be um, the Second Vatican Council, right? Um, so I think this movement is largely a response to the theological forms, uh, reforms of Vatican II in the mid 20th century. Um, however, these theological reforms alone do not explain this phenomenon. They're a, what I would call a necessary but not sufficient cause, right? Uh, these theological reforms impacted Catholicism all around the world, but it's really only in Israel that this particular phenomenon has arisen. The second main factor, um, would be, of course, the Holocaust. Um, and so, you know, I really am primarily looking at this as a post-Holocaust phenomenon more than a post-Vatican II phenomenon, although it really is both. So um, specifically, the, I'm looking at uh, 
self-evaluation on the part of Christians following the Holocaust, right? So many of those whom I met with and whose testimonies I read, if I wasn't able to meet with them personally, expressed that they had prior to World War II, in their minds, they had been rather blind to the reality of anti-Semitism. They knew a bit about the history, but they hadn't previously recognized it, its extent or its severity. And they also hadn't recognized the extent to which their own religious tradition was very culpable for this history of anti-Semitism. So as they were, as they said, you know, shocked awake by um, seeing um, in the aftermath of World War II what had happened, learning about this, they began this process of um, self-evaluation thinking about how their own religious traditions have been implicated in this history, much soul searching much and, and reflection. Um, and then of course, also we have, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the more numerically small, but still very significant number of Jewish conversions to Catholicism during the Holocaust, who then circled around and sort of became a part of this phenomenon in a sense. So the third main factor, in addition to the Second Vatican Council and uh, reflection on the Holocaust would be, the third would be um, the birth of the state of Israel. So um, some Christians um, saw the birth of the state of Israel as a sign of God's intervention or proof of God's mercy after the Holocaust. Um, for many of the Christians whom I look at in this book, it's seen as a sign of God's fidelity to the Jewish people. And again, this would be perspectives from Western Christians living in Israel, okay? Um, the majority of the indigenous Christians who I did speak with had starkly different interpretations of this. So, um, Another way that this really impacted um, this phenomenon is that much of the place um, known in Christian tradition as the Holy Land um, uh, had been um, prior to 1948, um, of course, not none of it was Israel, but also prior to 1967, much of this had not been in Israel. So we had Christians who were living in the old city who, um, after the Six Day War, were then living in Israel, right? Um, and also Christians living in other regions of um, what is now the West Bank, um, right? Had found themselves suddenly living in a Jewish milieu, in a Jewish state, and learned to develop very, very different understandings of the relationship of their faith to the context they were living in as they were immersed really in that Jewish culture. So those I think are really the three main factors, Vatican II, reflection on the Holocaust, and the experience of these Catholics living in um, Israel. So um, let's turn now to another topic, which is the notion of praying for the Jews. This term praying for the Jews is one that might very understandably give some people a kind of uncomfortable feeling, right? Um, and um, that's very understandable because this notion praying for the Jews has a history um, of um, proselytism um, and forced conversion as well, right? Um, it's a very uncomfortable um, concept for many, right? Um, the Christian desire for Jewish conversion actually is really as old as Christianity itself, right? Um, for its earliest decades, Christianity existed almost solely of um, Jewish believers in Jesus before it expanded to include Gentile believers, right? Um, but despite its origins, of course, as a movement within Judaism, deeply ingrained anti-Jewish theologies did eventually take root as Christianity expanded over the following centuries. And so then this desire to um, bring in Jewish converts to Christianity then eventually became one of the expressions of, or certainly linked to that anti-Judaism, right? Um, 
so clearly the history of the idea of, of Christian prayers for Jews is certainly problematic. And yet I was intrigued to find that so many of the people whom I interviewed and researched for this project said that their religious vocations were very much dedicated to praying for the Jews, as they put it. And yet they, and this is the important part, they were doing this activity with a completely different goal. Their prayers were not for the conversions of Jews rather, but they were praying for the thriving of Jews as Jews, right? They were um, very, very opposed to any sorts of conversion attempts and yet still maintained regular practices of, as I put it, praying for the Jews, right? Praying for the well-being of the Jewish people. So here we have a very different kind of praying for the Jews. Now, this leads us into some interesting theological issues, primarily involving soteriology and um, evangelism. Right? And just to be clear about my methodology in this, in this research, uh, in, in, this, in this book, in this research, um, I'm not asking sort of first degree theological questions, right? My questions are not about theological truth. I'm not taking any faith-based uh, stance in these issues at all. My investigation really is entirely anthropological in that I'm inquiring about the beliefs of those whom I'm researching, right? So that's just to make the, the methodological perspective clear. Now, um, given that, very interesting, intriguing issues um, about um, visions of um, soteriology, uh, about the notion, the Christian belief that Jesus is the universal savior of all people, right? So this phenomenon, really poses a challenge to this and to other Christian, traditional Christian faith claims. Um, in some cases, the kind of um, religious outlook that's evidenced within this phenomenon really does push against and at times even contradicts some of these essential Christian teachings, right? So um, nearly, all of the people whom I was able to interview did admit that they did not uphold all of the traditional Christian views regarding the identity of Jesus as a universal savior of all people. Most expressed that they couldn't pretend to know the final truth. They expressed a kind of doctrinal humility, really. Um, many, but not all, and I will get to that um, with time, it looks like we do have plenty of time to get to that. Um, so another complicated issue here involves the Christian imperative to evangelize. Um, so the question is, how do these uh, people expressing this phenomenon of Catholicism interpret this imperative given their beliefs about Judaism? If they're praying for the Jewish people, if this is part of the core of their religious call, if they have a quote call for the Jewish people, and it does not involve any desire for conversion, how do they understand their own traditions faith claims regarding salvation and the need to spread the word, right? So many felt torn. Many of those involved in this said that they firmly oppose any forms of proselytizing, and yet many said that they had a natural desire to share their faith, to share what really motivated their life and gave their own life meaning, yet they expressed that because of their very deep respect for Judaism, um, that they wouldn't think of expressing that because it could seem like they were trying to convert, right? So many felt this kind of torn feeling, right? So what I'm gonna do now, I think, is be a little more specific and look into two um, specific cases um, of two uh, Carmelite monks who knew each other quite well, but had very, very different perspectives 
Um, these two monks um, lived um, prior to my time, my research time um, in Israel from 2015 up until 2020 for this particular book. Um, and we're gonna look at uh, one very well-known monk known widely as Brother Daniel. Um, Oswald Rufison was his birth name. Um, Brother Daniel is known to many, uh, probably many on this call, um, for a number of reasons, primarily because um, as a Jewish convert to Catholicism, living in Israel, he um, applied for citizenship through the law of return. Uh, it was a very, very public case that happened um, in the same year as the Eichmann trial. So it also did, had extra um, public attention on legal cases at that time. And uh, he was denied citizenship through the law of return based on his identity as a Catholic and as a Catholic monk. And this then did set a precedence for um, an ongoing change in the law of return. So that's one of the reasons that he's known um, for his political impact. But what I'm gonna talk about is his perspective on the Jewish tradition that was originally his and on his own identity after he became Catholic. And I'm gonna compare this to another Carmelite monk who lived in the same monastery as him, but much less well-known. And this is uh, Father Elias Friedman. Um, I'm gonna refer to Brother Daniel as brother because that's primarily how he preferred to be called. Um, and uh, Father Friedman as such, because that is how he preferred to be called. So um, first, so Brother Daniel's beliefs and practices as a Catholic um, and as a convert from Judaism. His beliefs and practices certainly diverge from the norm of Catholic tradition. Um, Brother Daniel um, only wrote about this very, very sparingly. Um, his writings are hard to come by. Um, one of the best sources for his um, thoughts is a biography of him. Um, in the lion's den and also a few video recordings um, as well as a few short written pieces by him. Um, but he did claim that he believed that Christianity was best understood as a particular expression of Judaism, not just in its origins, but today, right? That's uh, brother Daniel's kind of unusual perspective. He wrote, quote, Christianity was not meant to be another religion, end quote. In his private, uh, in, his, in his own personal religious practice, he rarely mentioned the Trinity in liturgical rites. He did not say the creed during the mass and he very rarely crossed himself. Um, he also wrote, quote, I'm on the way to restore Jewish Christianity where these things did not exist, end quote. So regarding, um, missionary activity to Jews. He was adamantly opposed to any missionary activity to Jews, particularly in Israel. Um, and he was very clear about that. Yet at the same time, he did suggest that perhaps in his view, an eventual conversion of Jews to Catholicism might be desirable, right? And so even though he was against active proselytism. He didn't entirely depart from this, um, I think very Christian perspective on um, the Christian faith as being the ultimate truth. Um, he did ask that missionaries who were interested in missionary activity in, Judea, in, in Israel, ask them to quote, wait for some generations before engaging in missionary activity. We don't know what he would have meant by some generations if he were still alive today. Um, now, in contrast, let me look a bit at Brother Friedman. Okay, so um, Elias Friedman and Brother Daniel were both, as I mentioned, monks in the same monastery, um, in the Stella Maris Monastery in Haifa. They were both of the same generation. Um, they were both Jewish converts to Catholicism. They both converted during World War II, but under very different circumstances. Brother Daniel converted um, when his life was at risk um, 
a very long dramatic story, but he had, in very brief, he had been actually working for the Germans as a translator, hiding his identity, um, hiding his Jewish identity. Um, he engaged in a very heroic um, rescue, um, helping uh, inhabitants of the Mir ghetto escape um, and saved 300 lives through that ghetto escape. Um, his activities were discovered um, and um, he managed to escape um, even after his activities were discovered and on the run and in hiding, he converted to Catholicism. Maintained that conversion, of course, and then later became a Carmelite monk. Uh, Father Friedman um, did not, was not in a life-threatening situation. He was from South Africa. He was working as a medical doctor during the war um, and also converted during this time. And they both ended up, lo and behold, living as Carmelite monks in the same monastery with only a handful of monks. Now, um, while Brother Daniel's theology could certainly be called a kind of Judeocentric Catholicism, um, based on my use of the term. And while his theology bears many similarities to some of the others that I look at in this book, Father Friedman is really an outlier in that his, his Catholicism is certainly Judeo-centric, but his goals are radically different. He is, his aim, uh, Friedman's aim, was to create a community of Hebrew Catholics uh, composed of Catholics of Jewish heritage. Um, and he did found an organization called the Hebrew Catholics, which is um, active today, um, but unaffiliated and very different from the groups that I'm profiling in this book. Um, so Friedman's idea in founding the Hebrew Catholics was to create intentionally an atmosphere that would be attractive to potential Jewish converts. He very intentionally wanted to seek converts. Um, so his belief was that a community, um, and he began this, this work in 1940s um, theologically and founded it finally um, a few decades later in the 70s, I believe. I don't have the exact date here, pardon me, but I believe it's in the late 70s. Um, so, he believed that a community of Hebrew Catholics would pave the way to the eventual eschatological goal of the conversion of all Jewish people. So he wrote that he was very concerned for the fate of the Jewish people. Um, of course, his vision for what was best for the Jewish people, the vision of what he desired was mass conversion, which would of course affect the erasure of the Jewish people as such. Um, but that's not the way he saw it. He was unapologetically supersessionist in his uh, theology. Um, he believed that Jesus was the answer to the quote, Jewish problem, end quote. Um, he believed that all of the suffering in Jewish history of the past 2000 years was divine punishment for not believing in Jesus as the Messiah. Um, and he even went so far as to claim that the Holocaust was punishment for Jewish disbelief. He even claimed that the Holocaust was um, necessary to bring Jews to belief in Jesus. Um, so his, he wrote about this very directly, very explicitly in some of his earlier work in the 1940s. After the Second Vatican Council, um, he did tone down his arguments very much. He kind of moderated uh, them a bit, but the substance really remained the same. He just phrased his views in um, slightly less shocking and offensive language. Um, and yet uh, his 1987 book, um, was in fact imprinted with the Nihil Obstat and Imprimatur, which is the official Vatican declarations that a book is free of doctrinal or moral error, um, despite the fact that he, that he expressed these very things in that book, although in a more veiled way. So I speak about, and I see I have about 10 minutes more, so I'll just uh, start to wrap up here. But I just wanna say that I'm speaking about Father Friedman, 
here. Um, just to demonstrate the range of views and also to demonstrate this idea of Judeocentric Catholicism um, can move into very threatening territory as well, right? That it's not all a uh, happy, squishy kind of Jewish Christian reconciliation, right? Um, it takes many forms, right? Um, but the phenomenon that I found in Israel today, in those whose interviews I share in the book, and in the majority of people whose testimonies I found from over the past um, century, nearly century, the majority of them did not hold these, uh, the views that, that Friedman um, expresses. And the majority are very deeply dedicated to Jewish Christian reconciliation um, and to working against not only anti-Semitic teachings, but working against any kind of active missionizing of the Jewish people. Um, so I thought I'd share just a few quotes for some of the people I interviewed um, about their understandings of these um, soteriological questions, questions about salvation and how their Catholic faith um, informs their understanding of, um, of Judaism. Um, so um, Marina Fritz, who um, many of you on the call know, and perhaps she's even listening, um, said, as to the question of whether Jesus is the only way of salvation, and again, this is a quote from Marina, quote, as to the question of whether Jesus is the only way to salvation, my answer is no. And I claim that no one can say yes to that question. Who has absolute truth except God? Continuing her quote, so I am against all those who are out there trying to convert others to believe in Jesus as their savior. Let each one seek the truth and be faithful to their own search. If there is a God and if there is an afterlife, they will be there with God, end quote. Um, here's, so Marina is a sister of Sion. Here's another quote from another sister of Sion, uh, Sister Carmen, who goes by Sister Carmela when in Israel. She wrote, quote, for me, I think the Jewish people will be saved on their own premises, on their own teaching. How? I don't know. It's God's, God's wisdom. I can accept that God does it in his or her own way beyond me. Maybe in a few more generations, something will have a little something to say about that. Maybe. End quote. Um, okay. So, uh, and here's one more quote before we start to wrap up. Here's Sister anne Catherine, uh, also a sister of Zion, who said, quote, nobody can say the truth is in my hands. Nobody can say that. We are all walking toward an unknown. But the unknown that we know belongs to God. We cannot say, I know who Jesus is exactly. No, I do not know. End quote. So just a few concluding remarks here before I move to the conversation, to the discussion. Um, this phenomenon is equivocal. Um, its value and its impact on Jewish Christian relations um, and Catholic theologies are, can be interpreted in many different ways. They're rather ambiguous, I think. Um, the impetus behind its development has indeed been the eradication of anti-Judaism from Catholic thought and improved relations between Christians and Jews. But it is, of course, also complicated by a few problematic issues. One would be these claims of hybrid Christian Jewish identity, which can be very problematic and um, often encounter much resistance um, in Catholic and Jewish communities, um, but specifically in Jewish communities, because of this history of Jewish conversion to Christianity, um, which reflects the traumatic history of forced conversions uh, and also touches on some very crucial issues of um, not only religious taboos, but also the, the maintenance of the Jewish people throughout time. Um, 
Another way in which this phenomenon can be um, a bit problematic is when it swings towards some of the more extreme expressions of philosemitism, um, in which it can cast Jews and Judaism in an extraordinarily idealized light. And this idealized light, although very well intentioned, does reinforce essentializations, right? It produces stereotypes. And while they're positive stereotypes, they're stereotypes nonetheless, which preclude the perception of Jews as people like all others, right? So um, despite these and other problematic issues, this phenomenon has indeed really contributed um, already to greater education about Judaism um, and about Jewish experience to Christians. Um, and also to fuller recognition and acknowledgement um, of the history of Christian anti-Judaism. So the question of where it will go in the future is unknown. Um, this might possibly um, be a harbinger of future directions in Jewish Christian relations, or it may become a relic of the past with time. Um, it is you know, important to note that the three main factors behind it, the Holocaust, Vatican II, um, and the creation of the State of Israel were all mid 20th century events, um, which become further and further in the past as time goes on. Um, so, and many of the people who um, certainly who experienced the Holocaust firsthand, but also many of the people who um, are members of this phenomenon are um, certainly uh, growing in age um, and many are no longer with us. So really only time will tell where it will go. Um, all we can look at really is, is where it is right now and where it has been. Um, so thank you very much um, for, uh, for your attention here, for listening, for being with us. And um, I'm interested to hear some comments, questions and discussions from our audience. Great, thank you very much, Emma, for uh, that very helpful, illuminating um, summary and insight into your book. Uh, we do have some questions um, that have been typed in the chat, and I, I'm going to translate those out <laughs> as well to, to kind of expand the conversation. So uh, first, and sort of laying some of the groundwork again with your, your subjects, this is coming off of a question posed by Joseph Kelly. Uh, you're looking into these cases of, of Roman Catholic, and it seems like mo primarily Roman Catholic religious members of orders, uh, priests, nuns, uh, monks of various types. Uh, is is this a uniquely Catholic phenomenon? I mean, your, your, your subtitle is Judeo-Centric Catholicism in Israel uh, for your book. Um, is it uniquely Catholic? Is Are there any potential parallels with other kinds of Christians you've observed in the land of Israel? Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting question. Uh, thank you for that. Um, yes, I, it is uniquely Catholic. Now, there are certainly related um, expressions in, um, in, in, in certainly Protestant Christians um, in Israel. Um, I did not find or encounter any similar phenomenon um, within Orthodox Christianity in Israel. Um, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, this phenomenon as well is certainly not well known. It takes some digging, a lot of digging um, to find it, right? Now, Protestant um, uh, expressions of something similar um, are really quite different. Um, many of those Protestant expressions do align more closely with um, Christian Zionism um, and take more overtly political perspectives, um, whereas this phenomenon is um, not overtly political. Um, and there are some other um, distinctions as well, but, um, but it certainly is uniquely Catholic. Right, and just to follow up on that, there's another question here uh, that was posed uh, by, by uh, Joseph Kelly again. Did you talk, were any lay people uh, subjects of this, or is this again kind of fitting even within a, a further substrata of Catholic experience? Sure. Well, um, very few lay people, and that has to do with the demographic of Israel, right? Because this, these are people who, um, Catholics who 
live in Israel um, long term or for the rest of their lives, right? There are very few, um, very not none, but very few Catholics in Israel who are not uh, nuns, monks, or clergy, who are Western, if we can call it Western Catholics, who are that is, you know, not Indigenous Palestinian Catholics. Um, now there are certainly some, many um, are members of the Hebrew Catholic Vicariate of Israel, um, but it's primarily those nuns, monks, and so forth who are living full-time in Israel and are deeply engaged in, in, uh, in the study of Judaism and Jewish-Christian relations. Great, thank you. Um kind of taking a different tack and getting a little bit deeper into some of the um, theological aspects. This is picking up off of a uh, question posed by Will Moore around how he kind of understood uh, the question of what, what what would it mean to say that Jesus is a universal savior? And if you want to, uh, Will offer some nice thoughts there. But uh, there, there seems to be a question here about, is there, that I'm reframing here, is there something intrinsic to Jewish Christian dialogue, especially on the the Christian end of it, where the or the deeper Christians get into dialogue with Jewish people and encountering living Judaism, that some of the um, presuppositions of core aspects of Christian doctrine, like say around soteriology or Christology, begin to unwind. So I'm not asking you a theological question, but that anthropological question. Um, is there something about deep encounter that leads to questioning or reframing of theological presuppositions? Or is that something that perhaps is um, not a constant in your research, but shows up at occasional moments as you engage with your subjects? Mm -hmm. Right, that's, um, that's an interesting way to put it, a sort of uh, unwinding. Um, it's an interesting question. And um, I would say that it's not, uh, and thank you also for clarifying, it's an anthropological, uh, you know, question here, that it's certainly not a constant. Um, there are some um, people deeply involved in, in interreligious dialogue who are very, very um, dedicated to, to um, not unwinding any such, uh, you know, uh, core beliefs and so forth. But I think there also are a lot of others who find that um, in the process of that deep encounter with the other and um, that deep openness to the potential truth of another religion, that they really do question um, and doubt and reformulate um, their own faith. Um, so I think, you know, I, I have seen that evidence um, time and again. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not hearing your voice. Yes, I'm there. toggling between screens here. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, to follow up on that from Catherine Cornell, who I'm sure you know from BC here. Um, how, how aware did your subjects appear to be aware of developments in Christian thought um, around, uh, especially Christian theologies of Judaism is one way of framing that. Um, for instance, the 2015 Vatican document on uh, relations with Jews, the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. Um, are, do these seem like people who are really engaged with um, trends in the teachings of the church around approaching Judaism? Um, and as a follow-up question from that, how many overall people are we talking about in terms of this phenomenon? Mm -hmm. Right. So. Um Absolutely engaged. Absolutely. Um, I don't think there was an interview in which someone didn't mention to me uh, the gifts and calling. Um, and of course, you know, we're looking at um, at the Catholic religious, right? Nuns and monks, religious brothers and sisters um, and clergy. Um, so, you know, they really, really followed their tradition. Um, I had uh, one uh, cloistered nun who um, did not share, she, she was the only one in her monastery um, who had this kind of outlook. Um, and when she first came to meet me, she came, um, she got up from the table, walked back in, came back out and set down her copy of the gifts and calling 
put it all, nearly slammed it on the table and said, this is, um, uh, what was the exact word? Something like, this is what I live for. Now that this document is here, I have hope, right? Um, so yes. Oh, and, and, and the second part of the question is how, how small is this? Um, so it's really hard to give numbers because it's such a very private phenomenon. No one's walking around with big banners saying, this is what I think, right? Um, the uh, many, of course, many are, are, are living cloistered monastic lives anyway. And those who are um, living more active lives engaged in public education and so forth also are not wearing their faith in their sleeve um, as far as this. But, um, there were of the individuals um, living today whom I interviewed and, and, and present as personalities in the book, we have um, about 20, 25. Um, that's just of the book, but there are certainly, you know, in the hundreds um, of people who I encountered or read about or heard about who I wasn't able to meet personally. Yeah, and to follow, follow up on that, I think I've heard you speak uh, previously about uh, some of your research here. Um, there's hundreds of these people, but this also seems to be kind of a, a relatively unknown phenomenon. In some ways, this is sort of a, a word of mouth uh, network. So how do you even break into discovering these people? How, what were the degrees of, of openness or reluctance to talking to you about this? Um, how that ends work out in terms of you as, as someone um, who's in your own way inserting yourself into kind of these very deeply held uh, positions and beliefs. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, um, so I think as I briefly mentioned in the beginning of this talk, I had been doing a different research uh, project, right? But still interviewing people and I was interviewing about their ideas of what it means to be a holy land and so forth. And then they um, sort of brought this to me in the sense that I'd ask about, you know, their encounter with Jewish neighbors and, and so forth, right? Um, and then a few people started sharing these perspectives with me, right? And so after those first few interactions, I would ask them, do you know any others who feel the same way, right? Um, and so it became a very kind of um, word of mouth search, right? Um, and, uh, I, and at times it was very difficult. Um, you know, one of my, um, one of my um, leads was, you know, there's a monk who lives, um, he's a hermit and he lives on a cliff above the monastery of St. John of the Desert. And so if you go up to that monastery and you go up the cliff, you might find him, but also he doesn't speak English, right? So that kind of a, you know, that kind of thing. Or um, another lead, um, was someone who said, you should go to the Mount of Olives, a Benedictine monastery, and you should speak with sister so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so -and, -so. and she said, particularly sister Paula has, um, quote, a vocation for the Jewish people, right? So in that situation, I found myself speaking to the sister Paula, um, who um, uh, sadly, we, we, we lost her a couple of years ago. She passed away um, in the midst of my research. Um, but sister Paula, um, all I knew about her was that she had that quote, vocation for the Jewish people. I didn't know what that meant in her case. Um, and deep into our conversation, I began to catch onto some clues that she might have Jewish heritage. Well, it turns out that she um, uh, was uh, a, a, a Jewish child in Poland, um, experienced absolute horror and tragedy during the Holocaust. Um, and converted while, um, had her inner conversion while hiding in a root cellar and just wanting to die um, every day. Um, so, you know, I mean, it, it was really just a process of discovery like that is, there was, there was no more systematic way to do it. I mean, I would get on the phone and I would call every monastery and convent and so forth in Israel, um, but often that didn't take me very far. Did I, did I answer the question? Yeah, yeah, and to follow up, um, uh, um, uh, um, Yi Zhang has a, kind of a, a related question to this, which is around your ethnographic method. I think this is one of the really interesting things about your book is you're introducing ethnography into the field of Jewish-Christian relations, which I think is 
think your book might be one of the first to do that. And that's very interesting. I know your book has a section on ethnographic method and the questions, uh, uh, as, as uh, uh, Yi Zheng says here, uh, kind of your intersubjective relationship with your interviewers. Uh, you do have a considerable reflection on method and how to do this work responsibly and what it means to um, be an ethnographer. Um, can you just expand a little bit more on your method, your approach, and some of the critical issues that were at play for you as you developed this work? Mm -hmm. Right, right. So, um, I, you know, I'm very aware of and open about the fact that it can't be um, entirely objective um, that you know the that, that field work like this can't ever be because there is this person of the researcher present, right? When I would meet with someone, when I would speak with someone, that person would be um, presenting herself to me as um, as uh, you know in relationship to our conversation, and I could see her or him or them only through through my own lens, right? And so. Um, there's nothing, um, I, there's nothing autobiographical in this book whatsoever. It's not about me, you know, I, I, but the researcher's lens um, and the presence of myself as a researcher is something I try to be very, um, very transparent about, right? Um, another issue is that um, there's a lot of trust that um, it took time to build. Um, people would not open up about this right away. Sometimes it would take a few visits. Um, you know, I had someone who, uh, who you know, I would ask them to sign um, a waiver saying that I could, you know, use the, the works in publication. Um, after I returned home from one visit, one person called me and said, I want you to shred that waiver right now. I wish I hadn't signed it, right? Um, I went back, I visited her again. We talked about it again. And I said, you know, how do you feel about signing that again? She said, now, okay, I can sign it, right? It took time. I took trust. And so as a researcher, I want to also honor that. And that doesn't mean I'm going to change what they said by any means, but honor it by um, being compassionate in my analysis of them. And I don't, I think that there are some people who might argue that if I'm compassionate in my analysis, I'm weakening the scholarship. But I don't think that's the case because I think if we, completely um, strip all compassion out of this, we are not seeing the full picture, right? Because these are human beings and they're opening up and they're speaking to me in a relationship and they're talking about relationships. And if we analyze this like it's a machine, we're not going to understand the real, you know, the real dimensionality of it. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I want to pivot back to some other uh, questions, uh, some other directions. Uh, Ernest Rubenstein asked, uh, did any of your interviewees express feelings about Jewish law? I think halakha, uh, whether it's sufficient for salvation, keeping Torah. Um, you know, is there, it seems like there's some ambivalence about Jewish life and how Jews are saved um, in some of your interviewees. So is there anything positive about the Jewish tradition that's seen as salvific by them or were people more say apophatic <laughs> uh, about that, that question? Right, well, the full range, the full range, you know, um, I mean, from, from people who um, had considered converting to Judaism, right? Which um, particularly for someone who's already a nun or a monk, that's a pretty uh, dramatic step. Um, to a kind of um, apophatic, um, you know, uh, uh, perspective, um, but lots of um, uh, lots of familiarity with um, halakha. Um, you know, um, people who really knew their literature um, and uh, lots of deep respect. Um, but again, you know, it, it there there is a wide range. Yeah, and that's interesting that you mentioned familiarity because this is a question from David Mayan, which is, um, did any of these subjects take on Jewish ritual practices? Um, or is there a Judeo-centric approach leading them to having different interpretations of who Jesus is? Uh, 
especially in their reading of the New Testament and of the, the early Jesus movement. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, so yes, many did take on um, Jewish practices to a certain extent, right? So there are a handful of people who um, would go to um, synagogue services, um, but not hiding who they were. They would go to reform services, um, of which there are very few in Israel, of course, um, but they um, did this because they felt that they wanted to, to not hide who they were and to not offend anybody, and they felt that they'd be welcomed um, and were welcomed in that, in that context. Um, there uh, was also another community I visited who um, on um, Friday night would have a communal um, meal that and a communal liturgy that was very much like a uh, Kabbalat Shabbat liturgy. Um, they would sing um, psalms. They even had a, a blessing of bread and wine that was very, that was spoken through the Jewish blessing, yet in the hands of a Catholic priest had a very, very different association, right? Because of the tradition of the Eucharist, right? Um, so, you know, we had individuals going to synagogue services as well as communities who would, um, you know, practice certain modified elements of Jewish practice. Um, another, um, another tradition is um, that many um, would regularly chant the Psalms. So, so regularly chanting the Psalms is a traditional part of the liturgy of the hours of, of all Catholics, right? Um, and many Catholic um, monastics will do um, a fuller, longer version, right? Um, so many of those who I met in Jerusalem, um, at a monastery in Abu Ghosh, also the Sisters of Sion and Ein Karim in their um, uh, cloistered uh, sort of convent within, um, were chanting the Psalms in Hebrew, which of course is the language the Psalms are written in, right? So just by chanting them in their original language, they were in a sense, um, changing very much the, the, the associations of liturgy, right? It was the same liturgy that they were, um, you know, that they would have done in the Catholic tradition with no added lines about Jesus, nothing added outside of the Hebrew Psalms themselves, but it also became a kind of Jewish liturgy in a sense. Right, great. Um, and, and to pick up on the second part of David's question, actually to pair it with something Adam Gregorman asked um uh, christians historically have aspired to return to this world of the early church um which was jewish in large part um but they've also tried to like minimize in some ways that jewish identity when they aspire to return to the early church um did you find in any of these people a a, a desire to go back to origins um, saying that, you know, the way we are living in this Judeo-centric uh, context is, is sort of the way in which the church was originally meant to be. Is there a kind of a, a reassessment of how they're understanding the New Testament or the kind of the, the apostolic origins of the church? Mm, yeah, well, there was certainly um, a fairly frequent reference um, amongst many to that to that early church in Jerusalem. Um, in fact, the um, Hebrew Catholic Vicariate of Israel, which is um, for those who aren't familiar with it, um, it's the it's the collection of Catholic churches, um, Roman Catholic, you know, it's, it's essentially like parishes, right, um, for Hebrew speaking Catholics in Israel, um, because most Catholics in Israel and the West Bank are Arabic speaking, right? So for the Hebrew speaking Catholics, some of whom um, were converts or are in mixed Jewish Christian families or are, many of them are also um, immigrants from other countries, um, right? Um, so this church, particularly in its Jerusalem location sees itself very much as um, related to that very first church in um, the very first small collection of Jesus believers um, in the first century in Jerusalem. 
Um, and, uh, you know, Dan, maybe if you'd like to repeat, am, am I repeat some of that question if I am, I'm, yeah, if they're part um, of these questions I'm not addressing. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the questions is, is are, are they reframing some of their understandings of Christian origins itself? Like, are they coming to re reread, um, understand the New Testament, for instance, in new ways as a result of this, both being mm -hmm. in that location, um, this deep engagement with living Judaism, is that creating a reappraisal right. of the conflict? Right. The four well, texts. We Sure, sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, definitely see this in the work of Brother Daniel, right, uh, Oswald Rafeson, very clearly. Um, he saw the, um, the early Jewish church, if we can call it that, of the first century to be, have been the most kind of authentic. Um, and in his view, the centuries that followed that were um, a, a series of steps in the wrong direction, right? Um, so he really also reread the New Testament, um, and he was very clear about this in his interviews and in his writing, that he read the New Testament as um, a very Jewish book, um, as a, a, a Zionist book in a sense also, right? Um, written by a Jewish person in the land. Um, he also read the New Testament first um, when he was uh, in hiding in a hayloft um, in Poland. Um, longing for Israel. He had been a member of a Zionist youth group before the war. Um, and so in this mindset, and he's very open about that, that he started to interpret the New Testament that way, right? And then certainly for people living in Israel, yes, many are also, we're also reading the New Testament in that way. That, that reference to Brother Daniel and Hala often, um, the previous sister uh, who, you know, basically converts in a root cellar um links to a sort of a cluster of questions that have also been posed um what what did their family members make of their conversion these jews who become catholic religious perhaps many of their family members didn't survive the shoah uh but nonetheless or the the, the communities from which they came but on the flip side did any of them internalize any of the the anti-jewish elements in Catholicism, certainly in, in the late 1940s, uh, you don't have any of the interventions of the Second Vatican Council yet into Catholic theology. So how do these Jews make their way to Catholicism um, at that particular uh, mid-century point? And what was shaping them in that um, turn? So kind of, kind of a, a, an outward question and an inward question there about Jewish identity. Right, right. And there's, and there's, you know, a whole book right in that, right in that question. Right. Um, and so to, to, to begin to answer that, so that the question about how many, if, if any had internalized uh, anti-Semitism that was still, um, you know, quite explicit, particularly before the Second Vatican Council, um, uh, I'm sure there were many, but those, for those people, they wouldn't have been open about their Jewish identity and wouldn't have intentionally moved to Israel and would not have called it an Aliyah, right? So those whom I did come across had been, you know, longing to live in Israel. It was not easy once they, you know, started off as nuns or monks in Europe or elsewhere to be transferred to Israel. That doesn't, you know, doesn't happen automatically, um, really fought for it. Um, a number also tried um, tried to get citizenship. I talked to many people and read about many people who attempted and failed to get citizenship through the law of return. Um, so in that group, certainly there was not that internalized anti-Semitism, but I am I, I, I'm, I'm certain that there were many others who, who would have expressed that. Um, another part of that question involved addressed um, the views of family members. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, that also, you know, runs quite a range. So a number of people talked about being very accepted by their family members, going to visit their family members and Passover and so forth. Um, but not all. Um, others, you know, really um, had a terrible time with it. In fact, um, since we're speaking about Brother Daniel today, I'll, I'll refer to him again. There's a, um, a video clip I found of his brother who um, also made Aliyah and is an Israeli. Um, he and his brother, only from their family to survive the war, his brother said that 
in a war, sometimes people will lose an arm or a leg. And he said, but my brother lost his soul. Uh, I'm quoting him from memory, right? And so for him, it was um, a, a tragedy that his brother converted. Wow, that uh, really um, puts everything you've been saying in really stark contrast in terms of the, the reception of that. And um, maybe to, to pose a final question here that was just typed in from Dennis Taylor. And again, acknowledging your role more as anthropologist than theologian. Um, but what conclusions would you draw or what, what cautions might you have for Christians about if they want to draw closer to the Jewish roots of Christianity? Um, what might Christians want to keep in mind about their own belief in Jesus while trying to do that? Or as, as Dennis Taylor says here, is that just an impossible conundrum? Is there just something fundamentally irreconcilable here if a Christian has deeply held beliefs about Jesus and then wants to draw closer to Jewish roots, is there, all, is there always going to be some kind of impasse or have these Judeo-centric Catholics shown a path forward? Mm, yeah. Um, you know, it's a very difficult one to answer, um, but I'd say if there's any kind of um, warning um, or something to be careful of, I think that um, it's incredibly important to, to always keep in mind the difference and distinctiveness and to never sort of say, oh, Judaism, Christianity are all one, you know, that it's when those differences are collapsed. I think that um, a lot of the, um, of the unintended uh, disrespect for or offense to Judaism happens. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I think that that is sometimes from Christian perspective, sometimes there's, th that that's not seen. There's just the assumption that you can just kind of embrace Judaism and, um, you know, adopt and, um, and borrow from it willy nilly. Um, and so just to be careful of those dividing lines, I think. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, that's probably a good place for us to stop. Can you say briefly what the, your book on Jerusalem is going to be about? Oh, sure. Yeah. So um, the one is an edited volume, um, which is uh, on, on Jewish, Christian, and Muslim perspectives of um, the past and future of Jerusalem, like Jerusalem in memory and eschatology. Mm -hmm. um, the other is, is a monograph of my own um, on the idea of the Holy Land. Um, so the working title right now is the idea of the Holy Land, myth, memory, and imagination. Um, and that's on um, looking at really the idea as it's migrated through cultures and times and um, looking at uh, uh, the many, many, many different ideas of the Holy Land that um, uh, Christian ideas of the Holy Land that um, interact and clash on the ground in Jerusalem in, in, in quite remarkable ways. Wow, well, uh, uh, I'm looking forward to having that, that come out. Perhaps we could have you again uh, once that book is out. Um, I really wanna thank you um, for this offering. It's been fascinating. I'm very grateful to everyone who's participated and um, offered these questions. Um, I wanna acknowledge our behind the scenes technical, technical support and planning from our grad assistant, Sam Jai, and from our center's associate director, Dr. Camille Markey. Um, this event will be available in about a week um, and we'll email to everyone who registered. It'll be on our YouTube channel and our center website. Um, and so if you want to share this with other people, uh, please do also do click through for that, that link from Penn State Press if you want to purchase the book. Um, thank you again, uh, Emma, for uh, offering this to us. Thank you so much. It's really been an honor and a delight. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Have a great day, everyone. Be well. Mm -hmm.